had a great show. What we've done is we're going to bring exactly what you wanted. Last week, a lot of people were calling in and asking questions about the Power PC, and people left messages on the hotline, so we decided to get someone from Apple. We have Drew St. Marie from Apple here in, in Houston, and we're going to talk about the Power Macintosh. So, we, oh, by the way, it's Monday, May 16th. It's live, and you can call and ask questions about the Power, the Power Macintosh. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Portions of the American Computer Enthusiast Show made possible by Total CAD Systems, your authorized AutoCAD and Autodesk multimedia dealer. For more information on AutoCAD or 3D Studio, call 721-2233. In the battle to protect your children from violent crime, you have a weapon. 1-800-WE-PREVENT. Call now. Together, we will take a bite out of crime. influence are you under the air dances with the waters which brings the rain that feeds the land that is home to the animals all life dances together in a world so connected choosing one environmental cause can be hard earth share is 40 environmental charities working together you and your company can help by calling 1-800 my share. All life lives or doesn't together. Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. In case you just tuned in, this is the American Computer Enthusiast Show. Like I said before, it's Monday, May 16th. This is a live show. The phone number is 861-6283. 861-6283. You can call and ask us questions about our topic, which happens to be the Power Macintosh. We're going to be talking about it because we had a lot of people last week and people left messages and things about the Power PC. We decided, hey, we'll, we'll give you what you want. So we, we put together a show, and by the way, I really do appreciate our guests coming in on short notice. Uh, it's Drew St. Marie from Apple Computers here in Houston, and he's, he's a system engineer. And he's going to show us all kinds of fun stuff on, on how it compares. We actually have two different computers. We have a Power Macintosh and we have a Quadra. Quadra 700. We're going to compare apples with apples um, and show people exactly how they work and how they compare. But before we go on with the show, I've got a few announcements. First thing is uh, there will be a, well next week's show will be James and we'll be talking about, and Novell will be here, and we'll be talking about the new uh, DOS 7.0, their new, Novell's new DOS 7.0. Uh, also, this week, Wednesday and Thursday this week, at the George R. Brown Convention Center is the Computer and Office Expo. It's Computer and Office Expo, and it's from 10 to 5, Wednesday and Thursday. And I think, yeah, you get tickets? How can you get tickets? Anybody? I know there's tickets like in... Uh, we actually have some of them. Apple has tickets. Uh, Abus has tickets. You can get tickets anywhere. You can probably just go down there and probably just get in. I think you just fill out a card. Um, also, one thing that we talked about last week um, is we're going to, after next week's show, there's going to be a little break, about a six-week break, and we come back, we'll have all new shows for the summer and everything else, but one thing we want to do, and one thing we are going to do, is we're going to put our internet addresses for all the different hosts, so you can leave messages and get a hold of us at different times and tell us what you want to have on the show, so you can also do the hotline, or you can do internet. James is writing me a message here. Uh, DOS 7.0, next week's show is DOS 7.0 and personal netware. Okay, great. By the way, our floor manager's James over there. He's writing, th writing me notes as we're doing the show here. Uh, by the way, the phone line again is 861-6283 and our hotline, if you want to leave us messages uh, and what you'd like to see in our future shows, comments, or anything else is, well, there's the number right there, 587-5369, 587-5369. Give us a call. And that's actually a picture of me up there when you, when you see that little guy holding the phone up there. I modeled for that. Um, anyway, the... Uh, before, without further ado, I guess, what we had to do is <laughs> reintroduce uh, Drew here from Apple. And like I said, you are a system engineer. That's correct. 
And I guess what we got to do is, you've got a little slideshow. Exactly. And what I, I figure, I've got a thousand questions, and I'm sure a lot of people do that'll call in. Mm -hmm. But what I think you ought to do, you have a slideshow to probably go through most Absolutely. of the questions and answer a lot of them. And then, if anybody has any other questions, you can call us, 861-6283. Why don't okay. you go ahead and start show us? Thank you very much, Steve. Um, as you said, I, I do have a little presentation that really covers most of the technical features. It also talks a little bit about the directions Apple ta is taking with risk. And certainly, if you have any questions, just jump in if anything's unclear. All right. So let's go ahead and run through this. One thing I want to say before we go on, if there's a little flicker or a little line that goes up, it's just a little syncing problem. Just ignore it. It's, not, it's nothing to do with your TV, so don't adjust your TV. It's just some little syncing problem. Okay, go ahead. All right, well, as you probably know, the, the industry is really driven by price performance. And Apple recognizes this. And what we're really striving for is not necessarily just worksheets that update faster and word processing that paginates faster. What Apple's really trying to do is to add things that take a lot of horsepower, like telephony, messaging, voice recognition, multimedia. And because of, of what we see as our differentiation, the ability to do these things, we realized that we needed a lot of horsepower, CPU right. horsepower. And that's really why we took a look at RISC. And RISC, as you know, stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computing. It's a technology that was developed by IBM in the early 70s when they looked at how they would design a processor if memory were very cheap and very fast. And of course, back in those days, it wasn't. And the competing architecture was what was called CISC, Complex Instruction Set Computing, which was based basically on the fact that memory was slow and expensive. And all the microprocessor manufacturers tend to put all the stuff they could inside the processor because they couldn't go out to memory. They didn't want to because it took so long. Right. RISC is a different way of approaching it. And memory is fast. And comparatively speaking, by historical standards, it's fairly cheap today compared to what you, you paid for it years ago. So what we use now is we use the PowerPC chipset. It was uh, announced back in 1991 when we signed an agreement with Motorola and IBM to develop this new RISC technology. And in a nutshell, I'll talk a little bit about RISC and CISC, but it's really about great price performance. Right. Now, the Power Mac that I'm going to show tonight is a, a Power Macintosh 8100. And the performance is really good. But that was not our sole focus. Our number one priority really was uh, backward compatibility. Because we went out and talked to customers and said, what if we get you a really fast Macintosh? And they said, oh, yeah, we'd love that. But we said, what if it didn't run any of your old software? And they said, no, 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 no. no. That doesn't no work. So what they told us was that, is that we had to have great compatibility. And that was what our focus was on these products. And I'll talk a little bit later about the growth path where we see these machines going. Now, even if you don't get into the risk versus CISC argument, if you just look at the marketplace uh, and look at where risk is, uh, I don't think you can name a workstation manufacturer that uses a CISC-based chip, like the 68K or the Intel chip. Um, HP uses the PA. Sun uses Spark, IBM uses Power, DEC uses Alpha, uh, Silicon Graphics uses MIPS. Every major workstation manufacturer uses a RISC chip, right. and it's because of the tremendous performance. Uh, personal digital assistance, we of course have released the Newton, which is based on RISC. Uh, you'll see Motorola and other vendors this year introduce PDAs that are all based on RISC chips. And again, price performance is what is really driving this. In addition, even IBM and Digital are now incorporating RISC technology into their mini computers and mainframes. Hmm. So you tend to see it everywhere, and I think it's kind of a trend in the industry. Now, I could get into a real technical explanation of why RISC is faster, but uh, one of the folks in our office, actually a salesman, came up with this analogy, and I think it's very appropriate. Everybody's played Tetris. You know, you get these little pieces that fall down, and you try and light them up. Well, CISC is very similar to the way normal Tetris is played. In CISC, all of the instructions are basically differing lengths. Some are two bytes, some are three bytes. And that's analogous to the fact that these pieces are all different shapes. Each one of those instructions takes a different amount of time to execute, which is fairly analogous to the fact that some of these pieces you have to twist a couple of times in order to get them to lay right. right. For example, this piece, you could just let that fall right down. You wouldn't have to twist it at all. This guy, you might have to turn a couple of times. Well, in RISC, the architecture is very different. Virtually all of the instructions are the same length. So they're all like two blocks, like right. this. They all take roughly the same number of cycles to execute. So it's real easy to go in and just plop, 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 lay these things down. And, uh, 
that is really what risk is all about. In, in the microprocessor area, the two major ways of speeding up processors are through two techniques called pipelining and superscalar technology. And because of risk characteristics, namely that the instructions are all the same length, they execute in the same amount of time, those two techniques can be used very effectively. It's much more difficult to do it with CISC. Right. And, and not that you can't do it, you can, but it just takes a lot more money and a lot more time. Now the first fruits of this alliance are the PowerPC 601 chip. It is the chip that's running in this machine that I'm and showing And that's what's tonight. out now, right? That is exactly what's out right now. And it's actually out in three different flavors, a 60, a 66, and an 80 megahertz. Those are the speeds that we're shipping. The performance is excellent. I'll actually show a graph that compares it to uh, existing 486 and Pentium chips. It's a very efficient chip, meaning that it's very good in power consumption and heat dissipation. It only uses about six to eight watts compared, at least if you compare it to existing 66 megahertz Pentiums. They're fairly large chips. They consume quite a bit of power, about 14 watts, and they dissipate a lot of heat, as right. you'll notice on most Pentiums. They have big fans on them because the chip really does run hot. The real thing for us that makes this so attractive is the low cost. This chip that's in here, which is the 80 megahertz version, in lots of 10,000 costs about $417. Pentium chips today, the 66 megahertz, are around $700. Oh. And yet, this chip is substantially better performance than a lot of the 66 megahertz Pentiums. And finally, the growth path for the PowerPC architecture is really very good. Let's look at the performance now. And these are the spec mark numbers that come from the manufacturers. So they're all pretty much equally inflated. Uh, they're all you know, probably much more than what you'll really get because they're just running benchmarked on, right. on their optimized compilers. What you notice here is that in terms of integer performance, and I have the spec integer 92, which is just another benchmark for testing the integer performance, you'll see that the, the PowerPC and the uh, Pentium are fairly close, about 60 to 64. But on floating point performance, the 601 really shines. And most of the benchmarks that have come out, and even real world applications, where the application takes advantage of floating point, you really see a marked performance improvement over Pentium. And the machine that I'm running, which is the 80 megahertz, is way out here, close to 100 floating point spec marks. And again, the thing to take away from this is that this is a $700 chip. This is a $400 chip. Hmm. And, and that's one of the things that I think is really driving uh, Intel's response in the marketplace. You see that very quickly they're bringing the prices on the Pentium down a lot faster than they normally would because there's some real competitive pressures from IBM and Motorola with this right. chip. Also, I have just kind of for a reference point, kind of the, the architectural uh, view. And if you look at Intel, Intel's processor, the x86, really has been out for about 15 years. It, it was, its granddaddy was the 8080, and it came out really back in 1980. Now, if you look, by any measure, if you look at the computer industry, 15 years is a tremendously long time for an architecture to be around. I mean, right. mainframes that were built on processors 15 years ago aren't even around today. And yet, this microprocessor has prospered and indeed has become the standard. And really, if you look at the performance differences between succeeding uh, chip versions that came out, every time there was a pretty good performance difference. But it's getting smaller every time. From 8086 to 286, the performance delta was about 4 to 5x. 286 to 386, it was 3 to 4x. Uh, 386 to 486, it was 2 to 3. And InfoWorld just did a benchmark on 60 megahertz Pentiums versus DX2 486s, and they found the increase in real world apps only to be about 50%. And I think what you're seeing is that this architecture is kind of getting long in the tooth. It's difficult over 15 years to break new ground when you have to keep backward compatibility. Right. But again, that makes the, the, pro the whole platform very attractive. What Apple has done is, is we looked at that and said, we just have to break new ground. We have to go with a whole new architecture. And I think what you'll see with the PowerPC family is that in the same way you saw tremendous performance gains in these first few chips, you'll see that same thing with the first few members of the PowerPC family. The 603 is a, a low power a laptop type CPU that'll be out. It's actually out now in limited quantities. IBM is selling it right now. The 604 is a desktop unit that was just announced and uh, just basically went first silicon. 
and it's at 100 megahertz, and this chip is just extraordinary performance. Uh, the figures on it put it at about the same level as 150 megahertz Pentium, which probably won't be available for 12 to 18 months, and wow. yet it will be shipping this fall. So you're seeing some real increases in performance here. And early next year in the March-April time frame, the 620 will be out. And it's estimated by IBM and Motorola that that's a 250-plus Specmark chip, which is, wow. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing how fast the numbers are going up. So the 603, you say, is low-powered. It is a low-powered so that'll be like for power laptop, books and things? Power books, absolutely. In fact, we announced a series of power books today, the 500 series and the Duo series that are both upgradable to the 603 later in the year. Hmm. Great. Let's look at the kind of the roadmap. Uh, the 601 is out, came out in September of 1993. Uh, IBM and Motorola have shipped about 300,000 of these chips, and in fact, Apple hopes to get about a million out this year. The 603 is, is now shipping. It's in uh, IBM's laptops. The 604 should be in volume production probably later this year, early 95. And then the 620 will be out early in 95. You'll probably see it in machines in mid to late 95. But each one of these, uh, in terms of performance, I mean, it's just amazing how much they're putting in here. Uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal said they expect the emulators on the 604, PC emulators, to run at 486.66 to Pentium speeds. Mm. And that's an emulation, right. which is pretty impressive. Right. Now let's talk about Power Mac. What do we bring to the table? That's kind of the CPU. Uh, first off, this really is a Macintosh. It's still a Mac. It's not anything different. If you look at the interface, you'll see it's, it's exactly what the Mac has always been. And we did that for a good reason. Our customers said, you know, don't change the interface. Let us cope with the hardware changes and then go back and mess with the interface. We have a huge investment in software, in training. Why don't you just leave the interface alone? Let us try to digest all this new hardware first. And that's right. exactly what we did. Uh, and, in, and because we did it like that, and we did a very good job of emulating the 68K, all your old software runs. Uh, I think the best uh, testimony to how good the emulation is is that Mac Week, which is a fairly popular uh, trade reg, and certainly no, uh, no Apple champion. In fact, they're probably our most vocal critic. Uh, was very positive about the emulation. They ran 100 apps, 98 of them ran perfectly. Uh, they took all of the extensions from a Quadra 840, 33 of them, threw them into a 6100, which is our low-end power Macintosh, booted it up, and it ran just fine, and they were stunned. They said, mm. compatibility's excellent. It's really very good. And, and the best part is that the new software, the software that's been redone to take advantage of this new chip, just really flies. It's anywhere from two to ten times faster than a Quadra 950, wow. which is like a 33 megahertz 950. So most of the people, like, uh, like who would redo, they'd have to redo their software? Yeah. Exactly, and actually we've had quite a few, uh, quite a few uh, application developers announce that they're going to do that. To be exact, uh, through March, uh, March 14th, which was the date we introduced that, we had 150 developers that have announced their intentions to port their software. Currently, there's about 50 software applications that are shipping that have been redone, and they show some real tremendous To really take advantage. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of the Mac magazines out there, have, every month they show like a little list of what's Absolutely. new and, yeah. and what's being redone for the That's power. exactly right. And all the big guys are out there, Adobe, right. Aldous, Claris, Microsoft. Uh, they've all pretty much committed. WordPerfect, they ship day one. They're a word processor that takes advantage of, of the PowerPC. Let's talk just a little bit about emulated performance because we actually emulate a 68K. And the 68K we emulate is the 68LC040, which does not have a floating point processor. So if, if you want to run old software, old 68K software, it will run, and the performance you'll see will typically be from like a fast 030 machine, like a Mac 2CI, all the way up to a fast 040 machine, like the Quadra 40. The reason you see a variation in the performance is that we've rewritten certain parts of our operating system to be native, the performance sensitive parts. And what happens is, is that if an application spends a lot of their time in our drawing routines, which have all been redone native, it'll run very, very fast. If they use all of their own routines, they'll be emulated and they won't be quite as snappy. So you see a range of speed in emulation, but when you go to the native, I mean, there's no question. Yeah. It's, it's really, really fast. 
cost. Um, at our rollout, we actually had a, an 8100 side by side with a Sun Spark 10, and we've said that this machine provides workstation-like performance, and we we mean that literally. And we had the Spark 10, which is their fastest unit processor machine, side by side with this 8100, and we ran Wolfram's Mathematica. Went in and did a couple of fancy demos on both machines, and this machine was about 20% faster wow. than uh, a Sun Spark 10. Couple, couple that with the fact that this machine is about five thousand dollars yeah. versus a twenty thousand dollar Sun, and you can see why people are excited. But uh, I think we're going to see a lot of native apps. We're hoping that we have by, uh, about two hundred by year end. Now here's the lineup. We introduced on March 14th three different machines: an entry level machine, the 6100, which uses a 60 megahertz machine, uh, a 60 megahertz power p PC. A 7100, which is, uses the 66 megahertz uh, 601 chip, and then finally this machine that I'm showing today, the 8100, and it uses the fastest, the 80 megahertz power PC. Real quickly, I'll just run through the features. They all share the fact that they use a, a 601 RISC processor. They all have a lot of DMA. You know, Macs have gotten dinged in the past because we didn't do direct memory access. Right. On these machines, there's direct memory access on sound, on serial, on SCSI, on Ethernet, on ADB, and on floppy. Virtually every input has DMA on it. And as I like to say, if a little DMA is good, well, a lot just has to be better. <laughs> so we've put it on everything. Uh, a lot of people didn't think we'd be able to ship an AV version, which is the audio-visual version. It allows you to take your camcorder or VCR and plug it right into the back of the machine and do video in a window. You can frame grab, make QuickTime movies, and that's a nice feature. A lot of people didn't think we'd be able to do it for PowerPC, but we shipped that intro with all three machines. Hmm. All three of them have fast local bus type video. They all have 16-bit stereo sound. They all have built-in <coughs> Ethernet. They have fast serial ports. They all have eight megs of RAM standard on the motherboard. And the good news for uh, Quadra owners is that if they have a huge investment in their old memory, Quadra 610, 650, 800 users, we use the exact same SIM. So you literally, if you upgrade, can take the memory out of your 650 or 800 and snap it right into this That's machine. Right. It's standard uh, 80 nanosecond, 72 pin SIMs. We also offer soft windows bundles, which is a program from uh, Insignia that allows this machine to emulate uh, a PC. And I'll actually yeah, show you yeah, a little demo of that later on. Let's take a quick look now at the individual machines. Uh, as I said, the 6100 is our entry level machine has a 60 megahertz 601. It's expandable to 72 megs of RAM. Uh, it has one cache slot, and as you know, wrist chips really benefit from having cache. So this machine, you can snap in a 256 or a 512K cache SIM, and it really does make a big difference in performance, about right. a 30% improvement. And then there's room for a CD in, in a full-size half-height bay. The mid-range machine, as I said, is 66 megahertz. It's expandable up to 136 megs. And it, I think we're some of the only people in the industry that actually offer a machine that has two video outs. You can actually, with no extra hardware or software, hook two monitors to this machine, have them both active, drag windows back and forth between them. And this comes standard uh, out of the box with this machine. It offers uh, three new bus slots, and it's about 25% faster than the entry level machine. The high end, which is what I'm showing, uh, is an 80 megahertz machine. It's expandable to 264 megs of RAM. It also has two videos out, video port uh, outs. And the really neat part is that the video port, uh, the second video port, will support 24 bit, meaning 16 million colors, on our largest monitor, our 21 inch monitor, which is 1152 by 870. So you get the best bit depth at, on the biggest monitor, which is real 264 nice. 264 megs of RAM? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you want to load it up, you definitely can. It's, it's, be a, a, it's a monster. Speaking of cash, that's a lot of cash. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of cash. Now, here's the pricing. Uh, and the pricing is actually very aggressive. Our, our entry-level machine and Ingram Labs has done some benchmarks that show these machines compare very favorably with Pentiums. Our 6160 in an 8 meg of RAM, 160 meg hard drive configuration is about $1,820. These prices are not SRP, suggested retail prices. They are the price that we estimate to be the street, street price. price. And they're basically dealer costs plus about 15 to 20%. So you'll find these prices may be a little bit higher or lower yeah. than what you're looking for. A lot of people are getting rid of this 
suggested retail Right. Well, we no found point. that our competitors just used it as a bludgeon on right. us and said, oh, these apples are so expensive, when in reality nobody really paid SRPs. It no was a meaningless number. That's true. Uh, the mid-range is about 2900 and then the high end for an 8250 is about 4250 so Those you see the prices, prices are actually it's very good to aggressive. see that the prices are really competitive. Well, it's, it's interesting. You know, a year ago I was ruffling through my papers and I saw the price for uh, a price list for a year ago and there, a Quadra 700 was on there and with a monitor and keyboard it was $4,400. Right. The same machine today, which is the Quadra 605, it replaces the 700 and actually it's a little faster, is about $1,000. With a monitor and keyboard, about twelve to thirteen hundred bucks. So when people say, you know, Apple's too expensive, they're a premium price not solution. Anymore. It's really not true. Our margins are as low as anybody's in the industry. In fact, we're, we have lower margins than Compaq does, and and that's mm. a big change for Apple. The hardest thing for me in, on Apple, this is nothing wrong with Apple, but the, is all the names and all the numbers. It right. takes me forever to keep them all straight. Well, fortunately, I think we've come up with a new naming right. scheme that kind of makes sense. We put the speed of the processor right. in the name, and it'll allow us to change the models by ba by basically just changing the number. Right. In the past, whenever oh, we brought great. a new model out, it was a new name. It was Centris right. Quadra. What is 605, this? 605, 610, right. 637. Exactly. Now, here's an interesting thing, and I think a lot of uh, viewers will probably uh, be interested, and they might want to perk their ears up here, because I have the upgrade options. If you own an existing Quadra uh, or Mac 2 VI VX Performa 600, I have Hold upgrade on, options okay. here for you. Hold that thought, all right? Okay. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with the Apple, Apple guy, Drew, uh, Drew don't forget. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Here's one time it doesn't matter who your neighbor is. Here's the other. Life's too short. Stop the hate. doesn't just kill drunk drivers. Next time your friend insists on driving drunk, do whatever it takes to stop him. Portions of the American Computer Enthusiast Show made possible by Total CAD Systems, your authorized AutoCAD and Autodesk multimedia dealer. For more information on AutoCAD or 3D Studio, call 721 2233. In the battle to protect your children from violent crime, you have a weapon. 1 800 We Prevent. Call now. Together, we will take a bite out of crime. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. In case you just tuned in, this is the American Computer Enthusiast Show. My name is Steve Reeves, and I'm here with Drew St. Marie from Apple. We're talking about well, we're talking about the Power Macintosh, but really we're, all, we're talking about everything, the Power PC and the chipset and everything else. But if you have any questions, you can call and ask us questions. The number is 861-6283, 861-6283. But I interrupted them there when we had to take a break. I didn't realize we were taking a break so soon. Actually, it's not very soon. It's already, seven, it's already half, time, almost, half time almost. But we're talking about upgrade options. Why don't you go ahead and continue here? Well, the good news is that we have a lot of upgrade options. Basically, we have a motherboard upgrade option and we have an 040 PDS card. Uh, the way it works is for the Quadra and Centra 610, the 650, the 660 AV, the Quadra 800, 840 AV, the 2 VIVX, and the Performa 600, we offer what I call kind of like a complete gut swap. We take all the guts out, the whole printed circuit card, slide a new one in, and your machine now becomes a power PC. Do you get a little new name tag? Uh, absolutely. You get, actually, you get a new faceplate oh, okay. and a new backplate to accommodate the new ports. Uh, if you decide to do that, the price uh, v basically goes from about $1,000 to $2,000. It's, of course, the lowest for the Quadra 610. It's the most expensive for the Quadra 840. 
for those users that have a Quadra 700, 900, 950, 610, 650, or 800, we offer just a simple plug-in card. This mm. is very attractive because, number one, it's only $699, so it's not a, extremely expensive, but also it preserves your invest, investment in memory. Right. A lot of our users have big 950s with 256 megs, and we'd love to have them go out and buy a new PowerPC, Power uh, Macintosh. But, you know, they've only begun once they buy the machine. Then they need to go out and buy memory, and memory is pretty expensive. Right. 256 me megs of RAM will cost you several thousand dollars. Right. And for those users, this card is kind of the best of both worlds. You put it in, install some new software, and you have a new control panel that lets you turn the card on or off. Hmm. After you turn it on, you shut the machine down, bring it up, and you've now got a PowerPC Mac, a Power Macintosh. Right. And it's really very attractive. It uses all the host I.O. and DRAM, so you don't need to put any new uh, RAM in or add any other features than just the card. Oh, that's great. And it's a clock doubling card. If you put it in a 33 megahertz Mac, when you restart, it comes up as 66. Hmm. If you put it in a 20 megahertz machine like the Quadra 610, uh, the Centra 610, it comes up as a 40 megahertz power that's PC. Great. So it's a good deal. If you find that you don't like the upgrade card, you can turn the card off, shut down, bring it back up, and run the L40. And it is, it says they're user installable? Absolutely. You just plug it into the processor direct slot on each one right. of these machines. Finally, the last thing I want to mention is that, you know, we recognize we're just a small portion of the market, 10 to 15 percent by most guesstimates, even though uh, DataQuest last year uh, said that we were the number one PC vendor in the country. We shipped about 3.6 million units. So even though we're only 10 to 15 percent, we're kind of all alone because we do Mac and not right. DOS and Windows. We recognize we have to fit in, and we've taken two different approaches. One approach, we've actually gone and taken Intel hardware, and in the form of our DOS-compatible Quadra 610, we actually have a real Intel 48625 processor in that machine that allows you to flip back and forth between Windows and the Mac. Hmm. Uh, that's the hardware approach. On these machines, we've taken a software approach. We've gone to Insignia Solutions, which, by the way, is the company that does the uh, emulator that's inside of Windows NT. If you run Windows NT on any RISC-based machine, like the MIPS-based uh, machines or alphas, you're using the uh, emulator from Insignia. Insignia traded their emulator for the Windows source code, and they did the emulator that's the exact same hmm. emulator for the Power Max. Great. Uh, it's very good performance, and I'll show you a little demo. About the only gotchas are that it emulates the 286 instruction set. So it will not run enhanced mode applications. However, Insignia has stated they'll release a 486 emulator later this year. Right. So you'll be able to run all that enhanced mode stuff. And the upgrade, will, I'm sure, will I'm be sure very they'll reasonable. Upgrade, right. uh, the, the other thing is that because Insignia is licensed, the real source code from uh, Microsoft, they have claimed that indeed they will do a Chicago compatible version of this. Oh, great. So you'll be able to run the, that, the Chicago version as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's good news. You're answering all my questions. I don't have to. Well, there you have it. Uh, I tell you what, at this point, that's really all I plan to cover. If you have any questions, or we can take some calls, yeah. or I can just show you some. Uh, we have uh, some calls. We'll take some calls, and then we'll start it. showing some demos. Okay, great. Well, let's take some calls first here. We have uh, Parveen. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. I, I have uh, just purchased Macintosh uh, Performer 550, and uh, I thought that would be sufficient for my needs because I'm just starting to learn the computer. Mm -hmm. But my children who are in college, they tell me that this is not expandable, that later on if I want to have more options, I would be limited. What is your advice on that? Performer 550? Whether, you know, I still have time, I could return and get a new one. So well, I'm wondering whether I should go and uh, buy like a power PC in Macintosh or go for a quarter 650, which is a little more powerful, or just uh, this would be sufficient and it can be expanded. What do you think, Drew? Well, being from Apple, I mean, obviously you need the Power Macintosh <laughs> 8100 with 264 megs of RAM. I'm, I, actually, I'm kidding. It really depends on your need. If you're a first-time user, uh, you're doing spreadsheets, word processing, maybe some database stuff, limited graphics, uh, not much in the way of multimedia. 
I would say, you know, that, that Performa 550 or Performa 600 will be more than adequate. Right. Um, I, I can't imagine you at least initially needing more power than that, especially if you're a new user, you don't have a huge base of applications in your library. That would be a fine machine. Let's say you're really interested in doing high-end graphics, like maybe using Photoshop to do digital photo retouching or doing multimedia where you bring in video and mix it with sound and graphics absolutely look at a power Macintosh because you need all the horsepower there. But if you're just going to do productivity based applications like spreadsheeting, word processing, uh, the existing performers and the existing quadras, the 610 and 650, are will fine. be more than adequate. And also remember all the quadras are upgradable to PowerPC technology. So any quadra you buy, we will allow you to upgrade that uh, at a fairly reasonable cost to PowerPC technology. All right. That answer your question? Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for calling. I hope we answered your question. Oh, okay, Jay, do you have a question? Yes, I was calling to find out what kind of performance speed the uh, PowerPC has on a uh, soft Windows. All right. We can well, go ahead you know, and show this, it. Is, this is probably a good time to show something. All right, Windows. we'll bring it up and show you. Okay, so hold on. Just watch the screen there. All right, what I'm running is uh, Insignia Solutions Soft Windows, and this is an actual PC emulator. It's, it's emulating the 8286 chip, and you can see I'm running inside of a, a standard DOS window. I'll type VER to show you which version of uh, MS-DOS. I'm, of course, using the band version 6.2. They've fixed that. <laughs> we now use 6.21. We don't have any of that nasty double space stuff in there. Uh, it runs DOS very well. In fact, I'll, I'll go in and show you the Norton uh, SI. Now, I'm running the old Norton SI. This is from version 4.5 of the Norton right. Utilities. This will give you an idea of the kind of performance you can expect. And this thing usually gives me around uh, a 52. I have a Dell 486 back at the office, and it's about a 53. So right. it's very close to 486, 20, 25 performance. That's pretty good. Uh, let me run some, some DOS programs for you just to give you an idea of how they run. I'm running a little uh, shell here called Pathminder, but I'll launch Lotus 123. This is the old version of Lotus 123. And you can see how fast it is. You see that scrolling is very quick. I'm actually calculating about 3,000 signs here. And I'll up update this, and you see it's very snappy updating right. the signs. Uh, run the new Quattro Pro. This is from Borland. Well, it used to be. It's now from uh, Novell. Bought this for $39. You know, most games are cheaper right. than uh, spreadsheets these days. Kind of interesting. Now, this is really a DOS window, right. but you can see along the top is actually... Oh, yeah, Macintosh and I can still run window. if I want. Let's say I'm busy doing something and I want to switch uh, back to Mac and do something else. Well, I can easily go back into the Macintosh and run a different application here if I want to do that. And when I get ready to jump back into soft windows, I just select it, and here we go. Wow. I'll do a little graph for you, a three-dimensional graph. And you can see the performance is actually pretty decent. Now, I'm sure the thing that most people want to see is how it runs Windows. So right, because we're running DOS. That, that's a DOS application. Right that's now. exactly right. That's the Quattro Pro for DOS. Let me show you what Windows runs like. And this is a real Windows 3.1. It's not a crippled version. Uh, it's not like it's missing pieces. It's the real McCoy. And in fact, actually, every time they sell one of these, Microsoft gets some money because Insignia has licensed it from them, and they, they pay a royalty. Let's run some of the most popular apps in Windows. In fact, the most popular app, uh, Solitaire. A lot of folks think this is a screensaver, but it's actually a game. And you see the performance is pretty good. I mean, it, it's real snappy, updates fairly quickly. Run Minesweeper. Now, did you ever think you'd ever see Microsoft Windows on an, on an Apple? No, I never really did. I mean, this is actually pretty impressive to me because the performance is really, I think, very adequate for a lot of people. It's not as fast as like a 486 DX2, but it's really very good. And plus, you can do some really unique things with this. One of the things I want to show you is that uh, we can do the integration between Mac and Windows pretty seamlessly. Now, I'm launching uh, Excel, Microsoft Excel, and I've got that same spreadsheet I showed you before in Lotus 1, 2, 3, and Quattro. And I'm going to go in, and I've done a, a, th a little three-dimensional bar chart. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this bar chart and put it into a Mac app. So I just come up here and say Copy. And now I'm simply going to hide soft windows go back into the Mac side and I'll run an application on the Mac side like Claris Works and I'll paste that graphic that I just clipped right out of uh, uh, Windows, believe it or not, and paste it right in here. And I'll just go in and say paste. 
and there is the graphic that I took right out of Windows. From Windows. From Windows. Now I can go the other way as well. I can go in and say open my scrapbook. This is a Mac graphic. I can copy that and now I'll jump back into Soft Windows and I'll close the Excel spreadsheet and go in and open up Word for Windows, which I have on here, and I'll paste that Mac graphic into a uh, Word for Windows document. Now, what's nice is it's really easy for you to incorporate the best of both worlds. Right. Take, you know, if you like Harvard graphics and you're running that, and you've got a, uh, a sample graphic that you've worked on for hours, and now you want to place it in a presentation you're doing on the Mac, you can do just that. Let me just go in and open a letter here. I'll just open a sample document that uh, Microsoft provides with this app. It's called Business Letter. And I'll just go in and paste that graphic right under the date. And there is paste, and now you'll see uh, that graphic inside of uh, this application. Let me just size this a little bit so you can see the whole thing. And there it is. And you see the performance is actually pretty good. Right. It, it moves right along through it. This is uh, great. My, my feeling, having worked with it a lot, is it, it really does, on the 8100, it really does feel like uh, perhaps a high-end 386 to a low-end 486. Hmm. And for a lot of people, uh, you know, if, if all they want is a PC, they probably don't want this if, that, if that's all they're going to run. But for a lot of people who, who need to have both platforms in their office, this would be a very nice compromise. Best because, of both worlds. Yeah, and plus, the really strong suit that this product has is networking. It ships with a network client installed. So you can, by plugging into our Ethernet in the back, you can type Ethernet and it basically jumps on. Use an IPX and we'll connect to your network server. You can run Syscon and hmm. PConsole and launch applications off of your network server. It supports LAN Workplace for DOS, which is TCP IP. Right. It supports Banyan IP, the, the client for Banyan. It supports NetBuoy, so it will do Windows for work groups and it'll connect to LAN Manager and LAN Server. So it really has a wow. very good suite of connectivity. And it's very easy for someone in an environment where they have PCs and PC network operating systems to slide the Power Mac right in and be able to coexist. And that's really where we're positioning it. Well, that's why, the reason why we had, wanted to have you on here, because a lot of people had no, I don't think, well, I didn't know a lot of this, but right. I know a lot of people had no clue about the Power PC right. and where it was going and what was happening and what was exactly. going on in the Power Mac. and and how it works, but mm -hmm. this is great. This is pretty neat. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of calls. calls. The phones are going off, call. going off, go, ringing off the hook here. Paul, do you have a question? Uh, yes, you caught me on the web. I've been trying to write everything down so I could have it sort of set up. It's a very basic question, gentlemen. I, I understand you're trying to sell all these fantastic looking things, but uh, it's a kind of a, I'm trying to install Quicken 7 on a very old DOS unit, and it's a PCXT8086. All right. Now, what happens is I, I just, I do, it's, I'm using the five and a quarter mini floppy. It shows you how old this thing is. And what has happened is I put in the first of four of these mini floppies in, and I get a message, problem is the main area. And it, it tells me, make sure your computer has enough files to set and to run install. And, and in quotation marks, it says file set equals 16. Now, I have went into utilities or uh, PC tools trying to figure out how I could change that. And I can get a set is an actual DOS uh, program or in, in, inside kind of a running thing. And I can't change it. All right. Now, when I get it up, I see 20. Now, to that, uh, in my mind, I uh, they uh, say 16, and I'm Is it just saying the files? You mean in the config.sys, you think that's what he's talking about? Is that anybody out there know? James, you think that's what it is? It's just, okay, what you need to do is just go into your config.sys, which I'll tell you what we're going to do. We've got your number here. I think, we're, how about if we call you? Because we, we can figure that, because all you need to do is edit your config.sys and change your file. I can't edit it. I can't get, I, I, we'll, we'll show you how to do it. That, but I can't get into it to edit it. Um, we'll figure that it out. It might, it might be a, somebody might have changed some read-only read, read only file or something like that, and so uh -huh. we, we can change it for you. We'll and figure it out. with the attributes, should I change right. it? Turn the, uh, yeah, it might be read uh, only, or yeah. Well, we can figure out. I'll tell you what. We've got your number, great. and you're Paul. We'll call you back. We don't. We'll call you right after the show. All right. Thanks very much. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks Thank for calling. All right. We have uh, Ron. Do you have a question? 
I have a question about uh, the Apple, new Apple camera. I want to get a price on that Apple camera and how what kind of software I need to uh, transfer the pictures into the system. That's but, pretty cool. Yeah, That's, the, the new uh, Apple camera is is very nice. It's a, a digital camera. Uh, it's called the Quick Take 100, and it sells for an Apple price of about seven hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, it's very nice. It comes with a couple of batteries and the ability to store about thirty to thirty-two, uh, three twenty by two hundred pictures at twenty-four bits. It also has a high resolution mode where you can go uh, basically six forty by four eighty, and it stores fewer pictures at the higher resolution. It's very nice because we have both a Windows and a Macintosh version. It's very fast to transfer. You simply plug it into the serial port, run the software, and you get a gallery of all the pictures that are in the camera. And at that point, you can basically just copy the pictures and paste them into your application or save them as uh, standard graphics files like PIC files on the Mac. But it comes with all the software. It comes with all the software. It's already with the unit. You don't need to buy anything special except perhaps something like maybe Photoshop right. or some other editing package if you really want to do some, some serious editing. This allows you to go in and crop it and size it, uh, make it uh, larger, but it doesn't allow you to actually edit the picture directly. You need uh, more of a digital photo retouching package like, say, uh, uh, Photoshop, Photoshop to do that. Uh, do I ever have a, uh, like a catalog software that if I want to say I want to do a catalog of merchandise? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could do that with something like PageMaker or Quark Express. Uh, all those packages will allow you to do very nice page layout and create your own catalogs, your own newsletters, uh, business publications, uh, you know, weekly brochures, product brochures, all that stuff can be done very easily with something like PageMaker or, or right. Quark Express. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you. Hey, thanks for calling. Let me see, we have uh, Michelle, do you have a question? Yes, um, I have PageMaker, the, the newer PageMaker for my Centra 610, and I'm wanting to take a picture of what's on my screen, and I heard that there's like kind of the key punch you can punch in to take a picture of what's on your screen and then yeah print absolutely it out. You, you absolutely can do that I'll tell you how you can do it the first one way to do it and then there is another way to do it uh, basically by going in and buying a utility from a company called baseline publishing baseline makes a very nice uh, utility called exposure pro I think it's uh, about seventy nine dollars and it will allow you to take a snapshot of what's on your screen it's built into the Mac operating system to be able to do it, but Exposure gives you a lot more features. You can do all kinds of neat things with it. If you do a lot of them by Exposure, if you don't do a lot of them, if you hit Command-Shift-3, that will take a snapshot of what's on your screen, and then you can incorporate that picked right into, into your PageMaker document. And, and print it out? Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. It'll print out fine inside of PageMaker. Just it's, like it's, a regular file. It, exactly. It's saved as a PIC file, a P-I-C-T. That is the format of that picture. Oh, oh okay. But, yeah, yeah th that's easy to do. Aren't you glad you watched tonight? Yeah. That was Command-Shift-3, right? right. Command-Shift-3 will do it. And you'll actually hear the sound that is sort of like a camera clicking. You hit Command-Shift-3, and it'll go click, click, and you'll see at the root level of your drive a, a new thing that says Picture Zero. Oh, okay. Great. Thanks. Great. Hey, thanks for calling. Uh -huh, bye. You know, perhaps you ought to just show some performance differences between yeah. these two machines. Okay. Show the Quadro versus the Power Mac. Okay, that'd be great. Let's do that. Let's go ahead and do that. What I'm going to do is, is uh, I'm going to go in here and I, I have a Quadra 700 over here, and I'm going to run an application uh, that's called uh, Diatim, which basically maps uh, fairly complex geometric shapes. And I'm going to run the exact same application over here on the Power Macintosh and show you uh, side by side how well it's they do. It's my ET effect there. See what... All right, and here they are. Now, I don't know what you have on the screen, but if, if you, you can see both flip them. between them, you'll be able to see the dramatic difference in performance. You can see over here, it's flip. Yeah, you get flip. about a frame a second, flip. and over here, uh, it's just tremendous performance. Right. And, and, and essentially what we have is a 25 megahertz 040 versus the 80 megahertz power PC. And yeah. the performance on floating point stuff is like about a factor of 10 to 15. Well, we got this screen of the, everything up here. Why don't you t say exactly what, what's in this power PC? The, what's in this power PC machine as we have it configured right now is it has a, 
80 megahertz PowerPC 601 chip. This machine I'm currently running with 24 megs of RAM. It has a 250 meg hard disk internal. Uh, gratis, the folks at Micronet, they have also provided me with a one gigabyte drive, uh, a Micronet one gig drive. And the folks at Micronet are very generous. And they're, it's a very excellent drive. It's very fast, very good access times. Just the kind of drive you'd like to put on a Power Mac right. uh, because it really needs the throughput. So that's kind of the configuration we have here. What? I am running off the second video port, which supports millions of colors uh, on yeah. everything up to the 21. What kind of options can go in this PowerPC as far as hard drives? As far as hard drives, you can go anywhere from a 250 to a 500 to a 1 gigabyte drive. And there is a, a place inside of this machine that basically has two bays for either a removable or for a second uh, uh, hard disk, like a three and a half, That's what's on the five and here. a quarter inch oh, mechanism. Can't see it. Now. So you could just pop those off and slide in another mechanism. Maybe put a DAT drive in right. or a SideQuest cartridge, Bernoulli, whatever. Uh, all certainly nice options. Let me show you uh, another example of uh, performance here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, run this maze program. And for you Mac aficionados, you'll remember this maze program was actually the very first program that came on the 128K Mac. And you can see how it runs on this Quadra 700. It generates a random maze, and then you'll see a little red dot as it attempts to solve it. And there it's solving, 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 and it's finally done. Now over here on the Power Macintosh, you can see that it's just a little bit quicker. And there it generates the maze and it's done. Wow. We actually compared this to some sun uh, sparks at a, a government show we had and they were very impressed. So if you had an old, not actually old, not right. as new, Mac, right. an and you bought quadra. a new Power PC, a new Power Mac, you could leave it noon. As because you'd be, all your work right. would be finished by lunchtime. Yeah, you could get a life, so to speak. Right. That's what we say, get a life, right. get a power PC. Another thing that I want to show you that's kind of interesting is uh, everybody does fractals, and I'm going to go in and show you how you can do fractals on both of these machines. And these... Wait one second, oh, they bring up both. There it is, go ahead. Now. Okay, here, uh, here is fractals on the 68040, and you see them start to come down. And here are the fractals on the power PC. And you can see there's uh, quite a marked Big difference in performance. And this takes a tremendous amount of, of floating point horsepower. And this to be one's able still do doing it over here. Yeah, and it, it would be doing it for like three or four more minutes. Right. One other thing that I want to show, and it's kind of just a neat application, uh, is this graphing calculator. You know, Apple has always shipped a calculator, and it's right. a real simple thing. You go in here and bring up this little calculator. Not that fancy. You type numbers, and it adds them up. Well, Apple's engineer said, you know, now that we have all this horsepower, maybe we can do a really neat calculator. And of course, this thing does indeed add up things, but it'll do some really neat stuff. Like if you go in and say Z equals XY, it'll graph a three-dimensional chart down here. And I can go in and spin this thing, and you can see that it spins fairly snappily. I can go in and, uh, if I want, take a bitmap and actually paste the bitmap right onto this uh, three-dimensional surface. I'll go in and paste this right on top of here, and you'll see the little apple appear on there. Great. I can change the... Uh, the actual XY coordinates on the fly as it's spinning. That's great. And the neatest part is, is that if you want, you can go in here, and I'll put a real complicated equation in here. And if I want to, I can actually go in and have this thing solve this equation for me by highlighting the term I want and saying isolate term. If I want to solve for X, I just come down and say isolate term. You might not want to show this to your algebra students in college right. or in uh, high school they because they what will happen is, is, you know, the, the teacher will say, Johnny, how do you solve this equation? He'll say, well, teach, it's easy. You just hit command I. I do it all the time. Right. And of course, that won't really help them in learning <laughs> algebra. But this is a handy little utility. It right. lets you graph some really neat stuff. And uh, it's a, a very impressive application. Shows what you can do with the technology when you have a lot of horsepower. And it's uh, it really is pretty That's neat. That's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty impressive. We got a bunch. Let's of take it. Let's take, take one, another. Why don't you, while we're taking phone calls, can you load up? Can you do two things at once? Load up that thing where that's actually showing oh, that sure, image absolutely. on that cube, absolutely. and we'll take a call here. See if you can, we'll see if we can answer questions and talk at the same time. We only have three minutes left, so we've got to take these fast. Uh, Art, do you have a question? Uh, well, actually, two questions. Okay. Um, the first one was does. Or is Apple planning to offer like a, a PDS upgrade for the performance? I'm sorry, for the what? Oh, hold on, we just, we're losing here. Okay, go ahead and ask that question again. For the what? Is, is Apple planning on offering an upgrade, or PDS upgrade, for the Performance 600 series 
or is it just the ones that have been listed so far? That's my the, the Performa 600 series requires a motherboard upgrade. So you would literally put in a whole new circuit card. And that, I think the cost on a Performa 600 is about thirteen to $1,400 for a motherboard upgrade on yeah. that machine. Yeah, that was, that was there is no PDS upgrade, no, no uh, processor direct Performa. slot, not for the Pro Performa 600. It's All a motherboard right. upgrade only. Oh, is your other question? Uh, well, the second question was, if it was a motherboard upgrade, uh, could he roughly estimate what it would run for? About thirteen to fourteen hundred dollars is what my guess is. And real fast. That's the AV and, version. And they're available today. They are available now. Yeah, but that is that the AV version. Uh, that is not the AV version. You can buy an AV version, but it's a little bit more expensive. I think it's about one hundred fifty, two hundred more dollars. All right. Great. Thanks for calling. Uh, Frank, do you have a question? Yes, I have a Quadra 950, and I was kind of piggybacking on the last guy's question. I was wondering uh, what PDS options, I know there's an upgrade card available. I was wondering, though, what, how am I limited by getting the uh, PDS upgrade card? Well, the PDS upgrade card is available for the Quadra 900 and the 950. It's $699. When you plug this into your Quadra 950, it will turn your Quadra into a 66 megahertz power PC. It's, as I said, about $700. It comes with a meg of static RAM cache on the card. And in terms of performance, you'll probably get about 80 to 90 percent of the performance you'd get if you had a motherboard upgrade. So it's really a very attractive option because it allows you to use all the memory that you existing uh, you have in your existing machine and that you've paid for. You don't have to go out and buy new memory for it. I'd be able to use the. Uh uh, Windows software also with it? Yeah, absolutely. It'll run uh, soft Windows. Of course, it doesn't come with that card. You have to buy it separately. And the soft Windows software is about $200 right now. Uh, one last question. I was just going to ask you, what effect do you think this will have on the Intel market, this power PC eventually? Well, how is this going to affect the Intel market? How is it? Well, I tell you what, you know, I, I say this, and I think a lot of PC users get upset at me, but they agree after they think about it. I think it's a wonderful thing that Apple and Motorola and IBM have brought this out because we're saving PC owners and users millions of dollars. Intel is dropping the price on the Pentium right. faster than they ever would have, and, and all of their processors. And I think that's really good. I mean, PC users are not spending as much as they normally would. Pentium systems are coming down in price very quickly, right. and for people that bought those systems, I'm sure they would have spent more. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Parveen, do you have a question? Apparently not. You want me to show that? Uh, that yeah, go ahead and do that. that was, I think that was our up. last call anyway, so go ahead. This is uh, an example of what kind of power you get, and this allows me to run a QuickTime movie. But what's really neat is, is I can map it to a cube and rotate the cube. And you're actually seeing the 1984 commercial that was okay. run now it's on the back in 1984. And you can actually see it rotating. And each face of the cube has one of this movie mapped to it. And But it's putting on each face. That's pretty exactly. cool. Exactly. And so you're seeing a movie played on each one of the now, faces. Now, could you do that on the quadra? Or? Actually, I could, but, but it's not very, on, very but you slow. You could, but it's right. not something just you can do on right. this one. That's yeah. pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And I don't know if they can hear the sound or not, but it says, right. this, this is was a, the commercial song. that was run during the Super Bowl in 1984, right. just one time. All right. I think we're going to have to wrap it up here. Okay, right? great. We have about 30 seconds. I got to talk fast. Um, I want to first of all, I want to thank you for doing the show because no I, I mean it was I really sort of fast, it. sort of fast. I mean, I didn't. You didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare, right. but it was great. I mean, all the slides and everything else, and you seem to know your stuff too. <laughs> you, you always come come to us in a pinch. It, we, we work out great. Um, but I, I want, also want to make sure you watch next week's show, which is going to be James with uh, Novell. And uh, make sure you call our hotline, leave messages on it. And I guess that's just about it. So we'll see you next week. See you later.